scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, starting with the second half of verse 4. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for, whom, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is head, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Lord, I pray my soul can truly sing that it is well this morning. I pray that those who hear my voice right now are also feeling that their souls are singing it is well with their soul. Lord, life is different right now for us. Things have changed. We're still adjusting. We're still wanting things to go back to what we think is normal and at the same time think maybe there will never be a normal again. Lord, there's people working so many extra hours than they ever thought they could for the sake of their jobs or the kids they teach or the places they work or the patients they see. And I pray that they can today, this morning, say, it is well with my soul. Lord, there's others who seem all alone, by themselves, in their homes, hardly getting out, not sure what tomorrow looks like, not sure if they'll even take a step out of their front door. But I pray they also have the feeling that it is well with their soul. Lord, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. We thank you that you sacrificed yourself that we might have eternal life with you and our Father. We thank you, Lord, because of that we can say, it is well with my soul. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We come here into your house. We're watching on the screen so that we can come together as a group of people to praise your holy name, to worship your holy name, to call upon you, to sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, that we share that with the cherubim and the seraphim that are around your throne, that we come with our voices, that, that our voices are a sweet aroma to you, that you enjoy our praise. And wor- we worship you this morning, Lord. We also come to learn from you. We we sit at your feet this morning, Lord, to learn from you. You'll be speaking through your servant, Pat, this morning, and I pray that he is listening and that he will be giving us your word this morning, Lord. And I pray that then we are listening and hearing what you have to say to us. As we hold those Bibles in our hands one way or another, whether it's in paper or or our phones or whatever, Lord, we know it's your word coming to us, speaking to us even now. May it transform our lives. May it change us. Lord, give peace to those who need peace right now. Give rest to those who need rest. Give comfort to those who are lonely. Give comfort to those who are mourning. Give comfort to those who are scared. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you with everything, everything in our lives, and lay them before your feet. And that you'll cry with us. That you'll hug us when we need it. That you'll smile with us through the tears. That you'll celebrate us when we have joy and thanksgiving. That we can dance together in your presence. That we can sing your glory. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for our church as we are still struggling trying to hear your voice, as our board is still listening and wanting to know where you want us to go and who you want us to pick. 
Lord, make it clear to those who are making the decisions. And may whoever the person be that will eventually be up here guiding us and leading us, may that person already feel your presence leading them to us. May we be praying for them even now, whoever they may be, and that we pray for our board or the people deciding. Pray that you give them wisdom and give them patience. Give us patience in the midst of this time. Thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning. And we say, it is well with our soul. In your name we pray. Amen. Children, meet me in the back. Or actually, Miss Diane is there, ready for you. Read. Good morning. I'll be reading this morning out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. I don't know if some of you may have uh, been sharp and, and noticed something. It wasn't a coincidence that the past three weeks I've been trying to convey a message. I'm not much into preaching on themes, so I didn't mention it. <laughs> but I've been trying to, to tell a story that I believe God really has weighed hard on my month. Uh, on my heart through this month. And often I find in Scripture that Jesus used different ways to convey the same message. Jesus used the theme of love to convey a ministry. If I had to title what this theme was that I tried to convey, and you guys can share with me if I, if I got it or not, <laughs> it would be, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Let me read this message. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, there may, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. You are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God. 
You are his special people. Some of you may be asking, why? Why? Some of you may ask, why? Why, God, do you love me so much? Why? You may declare, this is what, this is the why, according to this passage. Is that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into that wonderful light. You see, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they had priest and they offered sacrifices to God on behalf of the people but today today we are priests today now we can come before the throne of God and offer our own sacrifices our own sacrifices You might be asking, what are the sacrifices we can bring to God? Before you run out and get sheep or goats or doves or, or whatever other sacrifices you may have read about that they offered in the Old Testament, go back, go back. What do you have, what do you have that God wants? Hmm. I know that my mighty God, he is the God of the heavens and the earth. What could he possibly want that I have, that I have? Let's take a look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. Now, now, Jesus, he quotes this as a new commandment in the New Testament. But let's take a look at this passage in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see, God is requiring the sacrifice of ourself, your whole heart, the whole heart. You see, <laughs> this is love. When you fall in love with somebody, you don't surrender to that person, part of your heart. No. You surrender your whole heart. If you did surrender only part of your heart, uh, there are marriage counselors for that because there will be trials. There, it, it's, it's, there's going to be issues there. There's going to be conflict that has, that has trouble being resolved. Why? Because one of the two parties did not surrender all of their heart in that commitment. God wants a commitment with us, a living sacrifice that's willing to surrender all of our heart to him. Let's take a look at Romans. Romans 12, 1. I have a number of my things here. 
Romans 12 1. We read this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So, like I said earlier, uh, you don't have to go get the sheep, the goats. There's nothing that needs to die here except ourself. But we are called to be a living sacrifice. Your whole person, your whole body, and your whole soul. A living sacrifice. Like I said earlier, the only thing that needs to die is your selfish self. I think I heard the saying that, oh, the babies, they're so innocent. No. They can be pretty selfish. (laughs) If they don't get their way right from the get-go, what do they do? They scream. They scream and scream and scream. My, My little granddaughter said, once about her younger sister. Mom, when is she going to stop screaming? Give her what she wants. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They learn. They learn young. And some people carry it well on into adulthood. But it's not through sheep on the altar being put to death. What good are you or I to God's plan if we're dead? You are to be this living sacrifice. How we live our lives matter. I don't know. I wouldn't put that on the shirt now with all the conflict about what matters and what don't matter. I didn't mean that to sound like a cliché. But how we live our lives does matter to God. People have said, let me worship and sing, but don't ask me to give up my actions. This attitude is not right. It's not right. Today, it can be hard to tell the difference between Christians that profess to be Christians, I'll put it that way, and non-Christians. When I was, when I was in the Navy and I was in Connecticut, I was at the Naval submarine base in Groton, Connecticut. My job there was maintenance supervisor where the sailors stayed in over 5,000 rooms in that, uh, on that base, the large base. And I had a crew of people that, that worked for me. God put one of the guys on my heart. And I started to work on him and invite him to church. I thought he was as lost as lost could be. <laughs> I, you know how God puts some project people on your hearts. And so I said to him, man, would you, would you come to church with, with us? This Sunday? And he says, 
I don't know, Pat. I'm, I'm a Christian. I already go to church. And I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I won't say what church he went to because I don't care. Uh, I don't think he was a reflection of that denomination. It was just a reflection of his lifestyle. I thought he was as lost, and he probably was as lost as lost can be. But for whatever reason, he identified himself as a Christian. As, as time went on, a, 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 another people transfer in and transfer out in the Navy quite often. That's good. Because if you get a problem child that works for you, wait a little while and he'll transfer out. A new one would come in. And this new guy comes in. God puts him on my heart. Now, he's been hanging out with, with that first guy that, that I had, was amazed that when he confessed that he was a Christian. So he started talking to me, and I invited him to church. And he said, Pat, I don't want to go to your church. I want to go to Bob's church. I said, oh, my goodness, why do you want to go to Bob's church? He says, because Bob goes to that church, and, and he goes to the bar every Friday afternoon with, with, with me after you cut me out early. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my goodness. You see, <laughs> how we live our lives does matter. People are watching relationships relationships change people change people lisa and i as parents when we we could tell <laughs> we had age limits on our our children when they should be able to date did it work no <laughs> Matter of fact, I, we could just tell. We could just tell when they were in a relationship because they changed. They changed. My daughters started getting all dolled up. My son, yes, he started to, <laughs> he started to shower. Boy, I tell you, if he watches this, he's gonna, I'm going to owe him dinner. Putting deodorant on. He, he flooded himself with all kinds of spray. I don't know. Boy, I can smell him coming a mile away. <laughs> I'm telling you what, relationships change people. It just does. It just does. If, if you're in a relationship and it, it hasn't affected you in some way. Maybe you ought to um, reevaluate that. There's something missing there. Our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what? It ought to change us too. It ought to change us. How does... How does that song go? I, I, I didn't have a hymnal at home to, to look this up, but I love that song, and it was on my heart when I was thinking about this. I stand, I stand in awe of you. I think we've sung it here before. I, there's something about the presence of God that we invite into our hearts and into our lives. That puts us in an awe, in an awe. I'm 
not going to sing that song. <laughs> but I think you know it. There, when we are in this relationship with Christ, or you get into a relationship with somebody you love, there are stop signs that are new in your life. There are some things your, your spouse is going to inform you very quickly that, uh, no, you don't do that. No more. <laughs> yeah, things, things have changed. Things have changed. The Holy Spirit will convict you of where these stop signs need to be. In, in the communities that you live in, have you ever had a new stop sign go up. I mean, right out of the blue, they decide to put a new stop sign. How many of you have run that stop sign like, and you're saying, oh my goodness, what was that red thing that flashed by me as I drove by? You know, they got pretty clever at this when they put up new stop signs. I think it has caused a lot of accidents when they have put up new stop signs. People get halfway into the intersection and then they jack on their brakes because they realize they run that stop sign. So what do they have done? They, they, they take these, these, these stop signs and they put them on these placards and they put them kind of like in the middle of the road. Have you noticed that? They really want to make sure that you know that this is a new stop sign. I believe God puts some stop signs in our lives when, when we enter into this new relationship with Jesus. I don't think, I think that God kind of understands. I think we call this grace in the spirit. Grace, God's grace through his spirit. When we find ourselves with a new stop sign and we just run right through it. I don't want you to, to, to freak out that you run a stop sign. Because God has grace. I thank God for that. I just wish sometimes those police officers had grace when, when you run that stop sign. But God does. Let's turn to, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.20. Second Timothy Chapter 2, let me start in verse 20. We read this. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some are for ignoble. If a, if a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument of noble purposes. Made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. You are valuable. <laughs> Let me say that. You are very valuable to God. If someone... If someone has told you that you do not matter, it's not true. It's not true. You matter to God. So how do you do this, this, this living sacrifice thing? How do you do this, this, 
this living sacrifice thing. Oh, Jesus put it this way. A new commandment I give you to love one another. If you love one another, all men will know that you are my disciple. A living sacrifice through love, love, love one another. Love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. But don't forget to love one another. In Psalm 119, 911, we can read this. This not only just love, it's obedience. How can a young man keep his way pure? By putting your word in my heart. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I, I like that, that the psalmist puts, I might not. <laughs> Just because you memorize God's word doesn't mean that you're guaranteed not to sin. It just means that the Holy Spirit has a little bit more conviction power because what you put in here and in here, it points you in the right direction to live it out, to live it out. Love, obedience is another thing. It's called trust. Trust. Let's turn to, to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Trust. He will direct your paths. God is not looking for for great ability. <laughs> if God was looking for great ability, he would never have called me to be a pastor. <laughs> God is not calling for great ability. But what God is calling, I found out, is that he calls for great availability to go to work for God. Go to work for God. Are you available to do what God wants you to do? I believe that's what he, he really wants. There was, there was this guy and his wife that came to our church in El Centro. He had some, I don't know, a handicap, you might say, a developmental handicap. He was a challenged person. Um, he started very a lot. He had a hard time conveying his thoughts. He would often close his eyes and 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 in his concentration, and I knew that when he closed his eyes tight as he was trying to say something, oh, it was going to take a while. 
for me, and I needed to perk up my ears and really listen. One of the things he might say is that, well, what, what could he do? What could he do in a church? What could he offer to serve the church? I tell you, he would show up. He insisted I give him a key. He came in early. He came to the church early, and he would, he would unlock the doors and make sure the, the air conditioners were turned on and the heat of the Imperial Valley in the summertime. In the wintertime, he made sure that the heat was on. He made sure there was coffee made. That's always important. <laughs> he, he, he went around, and, and, and after church, if there was a potluck, Man, he stayed late. He stayed late. One of the things that is nice about potlucks is that we all eat, and then you all go home. But there's usually a mess that's left behind. <laughs> and he would stay, and he would clean up the kitchen, wash down the tables so that the church was left spotless. I tell you why. You may have had a hard time understanding him when he talked. But his love and his heart to serve, boy, that spoke volumes. And he and his wife became very cherished people in the church. You see, sometimes, <laughs> I'm glad that Lisa's not here. She would have shouted an amen. But there's sometimes I can be a control freak, okay? You guys might not know me that well. Maybe it's a military thing. I don't know. But for all you, for all you control freaks out there, I have some bad news for you. You are not ever truly in control. <laughs> and the sooner that we control freaks realize this and we surrender to the Lord, we can understand and I think we can unwind because we can be wound up really tight, these control freaks. And we can unwind and unstress and live a life that's worth living. That's just some personal experience, probably too much information, but some personal information that, that I've learned over the years. See, I, I like to have everything in its place, and I believe there's a place for everything. I have come to realize that, yes, I'm not in control of this situation that I would maybe call walking with God. <laughs> I thank God uh, that God's in control, that God's in control. You know, and I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, it took me a while to, to realize that I can live with that God can be in control. <laughs> like I needed to give him permission. <laughs> now he just, he'll take control. This is how I've come to trust. Trust in God. I had to be reminded of that just, just yesterday. Just yesterday. Someone asked me. I said to somebody that and I, was, I, was, I was texting. I talked about texting last week. I won't revisit that. But I was texting somebody. And uh, 
I says, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew what God's plan was and what the future held. And this person just said, just stay put, will you? <laughs> just stay put. God knows. God knows. Have you always been one that got to know everything? I think you should figure it out by now. I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. <laughs> oh, my. It's just some, some things that are in our DNA, I think, and we can struggle with for a long time. But I have you know, I'm still learning. So what do you like? What do you like to offer your life to the Lord? I know it sounds like something is, is something that's impossible, but it's really not. You may have accepted Christ into your heart, but that's not what I'm saying here. Would you like to offer your life to the Lord? That's not the same thing as accepting Jesus into your heart. People can receive Jesus in their hearts. Hmm. Still have a struggle with surrendering it, their lives, to the Lord. My friends, if you, if you take the first step, I have come to know that the Lord will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to help you take the other steps on this journey called life. I heard a preacher preach this message when I first became a Christian. I was on the campus of uh, Point Loma Nazarene University at in their first church there. The church was full of people. Have you ever been in a church service where there is literally hundreds of people there? But yet, when the speaker is speaking, it's like you're the only person there. <laughs> and he's speaking right to you, right to you. I tell you, that's, that's the Lord working when that happens. So the speaker says, is there anyone out there having... Problems getting out of bed in the morning and having their quiet time with the Lord. In the church, of, there was hundreds of people there. I was the only one <laughs> who raised his hand. Like The preacher kind of chuckled and he, he says, Son, I, I truly believe that you're not the only one. <laughs> And I realized I was so embarrassed. I was the only one. I, it wasn't a question that he intended people to raise their hand. Oh, my. But he went on to say this. He said, how many would you like me as the pastor, as the speaker, to pray for you to get out of bed? And to have that quiet time. He says, you can raise your hands. Don't let this man don't be the only one to raise his hand. And many people raise their hand. He went on to say, I'm not going to pray for you. <laughs> what was that? The trick question. He says, this is what I'll do. 
he says, I'll pray this. I'll pray that if you get one foot out of bed, I'll pray, I'll pray that God helps you get the other foot out. You see, there's something that if it's going to be something offered to God, that it has to come from us. It has to come from us. A desire, a desire to follow through with it. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this, for this message, this, this message that you have put on my heart. And Lord, you know I've tried to convey this message this month. This message of how we are a chosen people. We often get it wrong. We can be difficult at times, dear Lord. I know you have great patience, dear Lord, and I say thank you. I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for the grace you have shown me when I have run some stop signs in my life. I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that having great ability is not a prerequisite of, of being loved by you. But just that we surrender. We surrender our life. Dear Lord, I pray. I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that as people have maybe look at a new way of surrendering, dear Lord Jesus, their their will, their control. And they lay it on the altar that you will come alongside and say, now, now, dear child of mine, I love you and I will direct your path. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.